I would like to start with a quote that says language is necessary to any form of social activity, but politics is arguably the one that relies on language more than most to accomplish its goals. Yeah, so uh, this is an overview of my talk. This, uh, the content of my talk is pretty much what's published, what was published last year uh, by the Journal of Corpus and Discourse Studies. It was a, a huge pleasure for me to publish this because actually I started uh, working on this right after the, the vote, the impeachment vote, but it took me a long, long time to uh, finish this work and well, you will see uh, why, yeah? So I will uh, set the scene what happened at, at the time, because uh, as I could see, uh, many of you are not uh, Brazilians here, so, but of course you have heard what happened here, but I'm just quickly said this. The motivation for this research, because as you could see from what um, Tony read about my bio, actually I work much more with translation, but I was very, very, I am interested in discourse and uh, I was very interested in what happened that day. So that's why I decided to do this. My objectives, my theoretical framework and the methodology I use, that's where I'm going to focus, uh, the analysis, uh, discussion and my concluding remarks. Yeah. So uh, what was happening at that time, yeah? So on uh, April 17th, 2016, the lower house uh, voted the impeachment of uh, Dilma Rousseff, as you may know, but, uh, uh, and she was accused of breaking fiscal laws. Everybody knows, yeah, uh, uh, what, what were the reasons why they, uh, the real reasons, well, <laughs> we also know, <laughs> Those are the, the, the reasons that were used, yeah? So she would have uh, broken fiscal laws. That was the second uh, impeachment in Brazil, yeah? The first was Fernando Collor. There was a very strong polarization at that time, yeah? So uh, we could um, see and watch lots of, of pro and counter government demonstrations. So uh, th that was a very difficult time for the country, yeah. The pro impeachment uh, stated that it was a legal means of dismissing politicians from their duties due to misconduct, whereas the ones who were counter impeachment said that uh, it was actually a coup, not impeachment and that it would have been initiated by Rousseff's opponents and endorsed by the media, especially global. Yeah. So as you may remember, there is even a picture here of what happened between Jean Willis uh, and Jair Bolsonaro, who well uh, ended as a president of our country. Um, and that session lasted for about six hours because the deputies had 10 seconds to, to go to the microphone and explain why they were uh, deciding for, against, or abstaining uh, from the impeachment, yeah? Well, and what happened? Uh, the, at the, during, the, the voting, we could see lots of memes, yeah, popping up, saying things like, for free Wi-Fi all over Brazil, I vote yes. In the name of my family, I vote yes. For the ones who don't know, that girl was accused of planning her parents' uh, murder. So uh, you can see that there were lots of this kind of joke, yeah, puns and everything, or 
uh, in the name of God, I vote yes. May God help us, I vote yes. So I was very curious to see that all the means finished with I vote yes. Yeah, so they were actually criticisms towards the ones who, who voted for the impeachment. Yeah, and the media as well. So we could see a headline just like this, God overthrows Brazil's president. Yeah, deputies justify their votes in God, morality and the family. The real motive behind the vote is forgotten. So they... Uh, or this one, um, what do pro-impeachment uh, deputy speeches reveal about our democracy? And then they, they used to count how many times the, the word God was spoken, or uh, son, daughter, family, and nation, and everything, yeah? So, I decided to analyze yeah, if the lexical choices of the two major groups of voters uh, statistically uh, differed, as they stated, both in uh, social uh, media and uh, mass media as well. Yeah, I'm remembering that they used to, to finish everything saying that those words were spoken by the ones who were pro-impeachment. Yeah, so I was curious to see, well, okay, there were more votes pro-impeachment, but did those words really differ? And if so, to what degree does this choice differ? Yeah, so I decided to use um, discourse, discourse studies, but with uh, corpus linguistics. But before I explain, uh, what I did, how I joined uh, both uh, theories, yeah, or approaches or whatever uh, they may uh, be called, I would like to, to explain uh, what those two frameworks used to think of each other, yeah? So, um, this course uh, analysis was, has, being accused of using methods such as introspection, elicitation, and unsystematic collection of anecdotal uh, evidence, yeah? And also that they investigate a small number of texts. So they want to, to, to check the analysis preconceived ideas. That's what we uh, usually call cherry picking. Yeah, so you go there and you choose exactly what you want to, to analyze. And well, actually, uh, even considering the, the impeachment, Dilma Rousseff's uh, impeachment, there were some other studies uh, carried out using discourse analysis, the, the traditional ones. And they just like chose some headlines or they chose the, the newspaper they, want to, they wanted to analyze and they uh, jumped into uh, conclusions about this. Well, that I didn't want to do this. But actually, there, there are many criticisms towards the corpus linguistics as well, yeah? Uh, sometimes we are accused of being interested only in the lexicon or morphosyntax, not discourse, so not, that are not, there's not a, a hard, uh, a, a large uh, research using corpus linguistics and uh, discourse, yeah? So this is another criticism and, well, unfortunately, it's true. Uh, and we are accused of focusing only on numbers, yeah, so we look at numbers and we jump into conclusions and we do not do any deep manual analysis of data. So I decided to use the, the corpus linguistic discourse analysis because I imagine uh, there were advantages and now I'm going to to share with you what I really did and what are the pros and cons of using 
uh, this methodology. Yeah. So this uh, corpus assisted discourse studies, they rely on semi-automatically retrieved data from whole texts, but only as the starting point. This is a way of lowering the degree of subjectivity of the analysis. Yeah? Um, it does not say that it will be totally objective because it would be impossible. Yeah? We choose, we choose what we are going to, to, to look more deeply into. So, uh, but this is a very good start in order to be more objective. Yeah. Um, this methodology enables the retrieval of patterns of language which occur naturally. So nothing, uh, not something that we just created for that uh, matter or at or that we decided to take the, the part of the text that really, really interested us. Yeah? It helped researchers to emphasize patterns of association, like collocations, because we need to go further. We may start with numbers, but then we need to go further. Yeah? So, uh, first of all, in order to carry on this study, I had to, uh, to have a corpus, yeah, and the corpus was exactly the transcribed speeches of the deputies that day. Uh, and well, this compilation was very easy because actually the Chambers department called Escrevendo Historia, Writing History, um, provides us with this transcription, yeah, we can find that. They, they say they transcribe those uh, memorable speeches, yeah, when they are really important, they, they make them available very uh, fast, yeah. And then uh, that was my corpus. Okay, so this is not... Okay, so, um, so what happened, we had 367 speeches uh, from deputies who were pro-impeachment, yeah. Uh, what account for 19,000 votes, 137 who were against the, the impeachment and they had 7,836 votes, yeah. And then there were only seven votes uh, which were abstentions. They didn't say yes or no. Very few votes. So this, this part was excluded from my analysis. I wanted to concentrate uh, exactly uh, on the yes and no answers. Yeah. So what I did, I used WordSmith uh, 7, yeah, and I'll tell you why. Uh, as, a, as my reference corpus, this is very important to say because I wanted to, to know what was characteristic of that session. Yeah, so uh, I used a part of Corpus Brasileiro, the part that uh, is about the Brazilian lower house sessions, okay? That was my reference corpus. And I only uh, chose as keywords, uh, words which occurred at least five times in the no votes and 12 in yes, because of the difference uh, we saw, yeah, uh, in the size of the, the votes. And I applied a combination of effect size, I, lo I used log ratio, and the statistical significance, uh, the log likelihood, because that's what nowadays is used by the social sciences. So for example, at that journal I applied my, my research to, they don't even consider um, research which did not use both statistical uh, uh, metrics because they do not um, trust the, the data very much. Yeah, so they think that if you use both, you have more chance of telling, 
of seeing what is really, really significant of uh, being analyzed. Okay, so why both? Because log ratio determines the difference between the frequencies of a given word in the two corpora. Yeah, and I included only the words which had a log ratio, a minimum of two. And, uh, and the log likelihood, it identifies large frequency differences, yeah, that were also statistically significant. And I used a minimum of 6.63. Those numbers are uh, accepted, are very well accepted by the social sciences, okay. And then I had my keywords, which I ranked uh, according to the log ratio, uh, keyness, okay, with both uh, yes and no votes, okay. Well, so let's see what the data told me. First of all, we, we know that Portuguese is a very inflected language. Yeah, we have lots of plural and feminine, masculine and everything. So I limitized this uh, manually because the lists were very short. Yeah, uh, with this memetization, this manual one, I had 53 keywords in the yes, corpus, 93 in no, and 28 uh, coincided, yeah, from this to, to lists. So I had a look, first of all, at what they had in common, yeah, what those words which were recurring, what uh, in both corpora told me, yeah. So the first thing I could notice was about altruism, yeah? So uh, the, uh, it is a very common practice of politicians to legitimize their decisions as a response to their voters' well-being. Yeah? So here, uh, this uh, words, the, those keywords like in the name of, in respect to, or to pay homage to plus Brazilian uh, family members like uh, son, child uh, in general, workers, people recurred in both subcorpora, both yes and no, not only yes as we had seen. So they, they want to say they are doing this not for them, not because it's good for them, but it's good for someone else, okay? They also appealed to emotion in both subcorpora, yeah? And this is a very, um, uh, this is a used practice among politicians because words that evoke in the interlocutor's minds a series of previous experiences and trigger emotional links with the past and they distort the previous opinion about something. So actually this is something that has been analyzed by uh, several researchers who work with political discourse. It's not something that is a characteristic of our uh, deputies, for example. And what we do, they legitimize what they believe and they demonize, delegitimize the opponent, yeah? So both groups constantly used words such as against, corruption, dictatorship, uh, coup, of course. The ones who were favorable to the impeachment, they used to say it's not coup, of course. And the ones who were against it, they said it is coup, but both groups used the, the, the word coup, yeah? So they said things like, enough of so much corruption, both groups used uh, this kind of resource, okay? Uh, what else did they have in common? They used 
to assume and share responsibilities and the use of the first person singular pronoun, like I, yeah, I vote yes, I am against. This is another resource that is uh, used by politicians in general, okay? Things like Mr. President, Mrs. and Mr. Deputies, I vote here today in favor of our children. This is very, very common. And also the first person plural, because it shortens the distance between the self and the interlocutor, just like this. Se nós, um, if we want to fix Brazil, we need to go until the end. Okay, so this is another uh, use of the word that's very much uh, linked to politicians. Well, uh, another uh, group of words that is used a lot by them is the ones related to religion. And here I have a quote that I, I think it's very interesting and summarizes very well what we are talking about. That is, to compete successfully, politicians need not always walk the religious walk, but they had better be able to talk the religious talk. And this is something that has been ha happening a lot and among uh, left-wing and uh, right-wing politicians as well. Yeah, Because in general, we think of religion as a resource used by right-wing politicians, but actually this is not true. Both groups usually use this. So that's what I noticed uh, in the corpus as well. Yeah, and this is uh, the religious rhetoric is used to justify policies, support ideological positions, present a public persona, underline personal ethical appeal, highlight individual moral suitability to be a leader. Yeah. And um, well, actually, of course, our uh, our deputies used this word a lot, the word God a lot. Yeah, but it came as no uh, surprise for the yes group because around forty percent of the deputies uh, belong to the Brazilian evangelical uh, bench. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, it, it came as no, as no su surprise that they uh, resorted to God more times. But it was interesting to see that the word God was also key uh, in the no subcorpus, the, the, the corpus of the ones who uh, voted against the process. So I had to look at this word more deeply, of course. Yeah. So I wanted to see the collocate of God in both uh, subcorpora, yeah? So what I noticed is that the word, uh, in spite of being used a lot, of course, uh, given the, the, the difference of the, um, the corpora, they were used by both yes and no, but they were not used in, with the same meaning, yeah? The yes deputies, the ones who voted for the, the impeachment, they made appeals, yeah? So they, they usually use God bless, Lord bless, yeah? I'd uh, saying God, or I'd like to plead God. So the, the, the collocates were more in line with the religious rhetoric, yeah? Uh, just like this, may God bless our country, Mr. President. This Mr. President is the president of the, the chamber, yeah? Whereas the no uh, deputies, actually they used God uh, in three different ways. They made criticism of those who supported impeachment, like, oh, they are talking in name of God, but actually they are not, blah, blah, blah. They used it as an interjection, like, oh, God, well, that's what we do all the time, uh, in spite of believing it or not, uh, and to invoke divine help, so in the religious, um, with the religious meaning, only twice. So we can see that both groups used the word God, but 
uh, I, I mean, uh, significantly, but not with the same meaning, okay? Just like this, this is an example. Uh, can you hear me? I don't know if I clicked something. Um, my God, how much hypocrisy, okay? Well, and then I, I had a look at what recurred only in pro-impeachment and counter-impeachment groups, yeah? So, of course, some things that are uh, kind of obvious, yeah? They were deciding if things would remain the same with the same president or if things would change, yeah? So the pro-impeachment deputies, they uh, legitimized their votes uh, say, talking about the future, yeah? So they use words like hope, future, change, better, because they are promising that things would be different if the impeachment uh, were approved, yeah? And they also used words of excitement, yeah? her uh, Brazil and, and everything. And what was uh, uh, um, recurring only in the yes subcorpus is also the, what's related to patriotism, but using a nation or Brazil or country. So the country uh, as a whole, yeah. Uh, the counter uh, impeachment deputies, they, they used a different strategy, of course. They appealed to the present, to what had been done in the past, but had um, results in the present, yeah? So they appealed to the legality of uh, Dilma's election and the illegality of impeachment, saying that it was not impeachment, but a coup. They used words like legitimacy, ballot boxes, respect, sovereignty of the popular vote, fought for democracy, defend democracy and constitution, yeah. They also made accusations, of course, so they uh, shouted words like coupies, cowards, farce, hypocrisy, uh, corrupts and everything, because of course we were against what was going on. Uh, and they reminded the, the people, yeah, because that, that day, uh, it was a Sunday, there were many, many, many people watching TV live, yeah, uh, to check how the deputies would vote. So they uh, reminded their voters, yeah, uh, of the accomplishments of that government and the government before that, uh, in defense of minorities. So they use words like Bolsa Família, the, the, the program, yeah, uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida, the popular programs to help uh, poor people, uh, land reform, fight, workers, poor youth. So they talked in the name of the minorities, okay? Well, so uh, in order to, to summarize everything with this corpus, assi uh, uh, corpus assisted discourse analysis, yeah, I could answer the first question that uh, called my attention that was around the so-called triad, God, family, and nation. And I noticed that reference to God and family members recur both in pro and counter impeachment speeches, although sometimes with in different contexts. Yeah, of course, there were lots of the word familia in the no subcorpus, but because of the program, Bolsa Familia as well. Yeah, so if I if we look at if we just count words and if we just count uh, isolated words, we cannot jump into conclusions about how the meaning of the, uh, uh, of the word in that context. So that's very, very important to do this manual analysis, yeah? Nation, uh, on the other hand, was key only in pro-impeachment speeches, yeah? 
So uh, that was a strategy for legitimizing votes through reference to patriotism. And it was really uh, recurring only in the yes. But speaking in the name of the voters by making reference to the corresponding states and cities the deputies are from and where their voters are was a recurrent strategy of both pro and counter impeachment deputies. So we could notice a lot of uh, Bahia, Salvador, Minas, well, Sao Paulo. So all the uh, cities and states were mentioned by both yes and no deputies, okay? The wor words related to altruism, responsibility, emotion, and religion, both used, corroborate other researchers' assumptions about political strategies of legitimization and delegitimization, regardless of ideology. So actually, uh, by analyzing only the words they used, it, it would be dif difficult to say if they are left wing or right wing, because uh, as Tilton had already uh, concluded, their words are, are very, uh, they are used in a very uh, strategic way. So it's not something that would show really uh, real differences about what they think or what about they do, yeah? Uh, in spite of representing antagonistic opinions about the process, some were pro and the others were counter impeachment, they tended to two similar words to justify their votes, sometimes with different meanings. So only the analysis of the context could tell one from the other, yeah? Both yes and no speeches repeatedly resort to mutual uh, offenses to delegitimize their opponents. Yeah, the first person plural, as we saw, uh, were used um, uh, to to share their responsibilities with the ones who were listening to them. And this is another strategy they use to convey a sense of collectivity and contribute for trustworthiness. So actually, this is another strategy that politicians use, yeah? So, uh, in conclusion, the quantitative analysis based on keywords combined with the manual analysis helps reveal data that would otherwise be restricted only to randomly chosen examples and biased interpretation of the analysis. Just like what happened, in my opinion, or, well, I could show you with the memes and with the headline as well, yeah? The mere counting of decontextualized words should not surface to jump to conclusions about the deputy's ideology. Yeah? Uh, and the corpus assisted discourse studies allow for a more objective discourse analysis through the uh, identification of patterns by computational tools as a starting point, but always remembering that total objectivity is impossible. Yeah. Uh, well, those are my references. As I told you, if you are interested in reading more details about this research, it is published. And I'd like to thank you very much. And if you have.